Singapore is opening a new vaccinated travel lane with South Korea with no quarantine required at either end. An airborne surveillance system that sniffs out COVID-19 will be speaking to the researchers behind it. And this little guy is not even two months old but he's already got six baby teeth. It's 5.30pm here in Singapore. You're watching The Big Story. I'm Harianto Diman. Remember to subscribe to the Straight Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Singapore and South Korea today agreeing to open vaccinated travel lanes between both countries. Singapore residents, it means that if you're fully vaccinated against COVID-19 from November 15th, you'll be able to travel to South Korea without needing to self-quarantine there and SHN when you return. Instead, you'll need to do PCR tests. There will also be no restrictions on the travel purpose and itinerary. And Singapore and South Korea will mutually recognise each other's COVID-19 vaccination certificates. The Transport Ministry says more details will be announced in due course. When the VTL scheme with Germany and Brunei was announced in August, in addition to flying designated flights and taking up to four PCR tests, vaccinated travellers who met certain requirements could enter Singapore quarantine-free. Now, posting on Facebook, Transport Minister S. Warren says that the VTLs between Singapore and South Korea will be the first of its kind between two major Asian aviation hubs, marking a new milestone as air travel resumes in a careful and calibrated manner. Joining us for more is Chan Guacheng, Executive Director at Chan Brothers Group. Welcome to the show, ma'am. What's your reaction to today's announcement? How popular is South Korea as a holiday destination for Singaporeans? We are definitely, we are definitely very excited to hear of this announcement. South Korea is a top five popular destinations for Singaporeans due to its four seasons, especially in autumn and winter, the great food, shopping and attractions. And also the immense popularity of K-pop and K-dramas have also positively impacted the appeal of South Korea to promoting tourism based on Korean culture and also their K-drama locations. This can be seen evidently and recently by the global success of the current trending hit series like the Squid Game, Actually, prior to this announcement, we have already launched a registration of interest for Korea on our Facebook and website, and we have received overwhelming response. We have already foreseen there will be a surge in interest and demand of the destination. With this official announcement, we have launched two Korea VTL ski and non-ski itineraries just in time for Singaporeans to enjoy the seasonal attraction and our customers have already called in to make enquiries. Definitely popular culture would influence uh, the decision, yeah? Let's talk about Singapore's VTL with Germany, which launched on September 8th. Are you seeing strong demand so far for travel to Germany? Oh yes, we have seen a strong rising demand and positive take up of our tours to Germany. And you know, thanks to this uh, vaccinated travel lane. In fact, we are sending our first tour group to Germany next week, next Monday, and this will be the first full size and biggest tour group from Singapore traveling under the VTL. This group of 20 tra travelers indicative of 100% take up of uh, the maximum group size of 20 travelers, signals the green shoots of travel recovery. We are heartened by the vote of confidence travellers continue to put in Chamberlain's travel and they can expect us to roll out more itineraries soon on Germany and other destinations. Certainly very exciting times ahead, Guacheng. Thank you so much for coming on to the show and uh, certainly all the best with the upcoming tour to Germany. That was Chan Guacheng, Executive Director at Chan Brothers Group. More VTLs are expected to be on the way. Speaking in Washington, D.C. yesterday, 
Trade and Industry Minister Gan Kim Yong said Singapore is working on establishing a VTL with the US and wants to conclude it before the end of the year. Although new cases, hospitalizations and deaths are falling there, authorities say the pandemic remains a potent threat. About 68 million eligible Americans have yet to be vaccinated, leaving the country vulnerable to continued surges. India will reopen for tourists from October 15th after being closed for more than a year. Following a spike in cases earlier this year, infection numbers have since fallen sharply. And the government, under pressure from the tourism industry, announced the loosening yesterday. Tourist visas will be granted for foreigners arriving on charter flights from October 15th and from November 15th for those arriving on other flights. Back home, 60 FMB outlets have been penalised for breaching COVID-19 rules since mid-September. 36 were ordered to close temporarily and these include repeat offender Kopitiam at Tampines Mall, which has been closed since September 24th. Now, it will reopen on October 14th. Toast Box at City Square Mall was also ordered to close from October 2nd to 11th. Another 21 outlets were fined, including popular haunts like Dumpling Darlings at Amoy Street, Putian at Parkway Parade and Sunday Folks in Chip Bee Gardens. And three pivoted nightlife establishments had their food licences permanently revoked. They are Mong Sakon and Prajin Karaoke at Golden Mile Complex and Paklato at Park Lane Shopping Mall. 3,483 new COVID-19 cases were reported yesterday. 2,783 in the community, 692 from the dorms and 8 imported. Three more deaths were also announced. 1,534 cases were in hospital as at yesterday. 297 patients needed oxygen support and 40 in ICU. Of those very ill, 281 are above 60 years old. Scientists and doctors from Singapore have developed an airborne surveillance system that detects the presence of COVID-19. And this is what the device looks like. The team from the Singapore Centre for Environmental Life Sciences Engineering at Nanyang Technological University and the NUS Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine trialled it in two inpatient wards of a local hospital caring for active COVID-19 patients. They found that the air surveillance approach produced a higher detection rate of the virus compared with surface swab samples collected in the same area. Singapore currently uses wastewater testing as a means of detecting viral fragments. To tell us more, I'm joined by Associate Professor David Allen from the Infectious Diseases Translational Research Programme at NUS's Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, as well as the study's co-lead author, Dr. Irvan Luhung. He's a Senior Research Fellow at the Singapore Centre for Environmental Life Sciences Engineering. Welcome, gentlemen. What are the main reasons for embarking on this air surveillance approach? Prof. Allen, let's start with you. Thanks, John. Um, it's a proof of concept uh, exercise. Uh, we're interested in finding out if we could detect virus through this method, um, it, particularly in areas in the hospital where there's high flow, uh, high ventilation. Um, so in negative pressure rooms and in open cohort wards, uh, which is where we have many people with COVID, uh, but it's open to the uh, ventilation from outdoors. Um, so it was important for us to see if uh, we could detect it by this method and where we could detect it. Right. Uh, Dr. Lung, anything that you might want to add as well? Yes, exactly as uh, uh, Prof. Allen said. I think uh, uh, an additional idea that I can add is that if you imagine if you uh, perform a nasopharyngeal swab on a single person with this air sampling, and if you uh, try to do air surveillance in a, in a space where a lot of people agglomerate, you can imagine that one air sample can possibly represent this uh, big number of people. So you can save a bit of resources on that side. Right. And Dr. Lo Hong, now that you have some data from the samples, how and where can this uh, device be used? Uh, in principle, I think it can be used anywhere. 
So, but of course, uh, you can you must think about all the uh, important parameters when you do uh, this type of surveillance. If you compare, for example, Hawker Centers, which is semi-outdoor, right, to a mech mechanically ventilated office space, you can imagine that the airflow pattern, the temperatures, and all the environment is very different. So in that case, we may need to do a lot of fine tuning uh, to maximize the potential of this airborne surveillance. Uh, Prof. Allen, on a larger scale, how would this contribute to the larger COVID-19 fight? You know, especially when Singapore has transitioned to endemicity eventually. I mean, after all, living with the disease means SARS-CoV-2 is all around us. Well, we're not just looking at SARS-CoV-2 as the only target. We're looking at respiratory viruses. We wanted to see that this would work. We wanted to see if we could isolate uh, the virus um, it, and to grow the virus because that would be meaningful to infection control and, and also transmission issues. But the places where it would be useful, even in the setting of endemicity, would be uh, in places where there are vulnerable people. So uh, in hospitals where there's cancer patients or transplant patients, or places where we might introduce more virus into the community or, or bring people into the community that may be uh, not vaccinated or incompletely vaccinated or vaccinated not so well, um, it, that would potentially add a burden to our healthcare system. So there's, there's I think the potential uses, as Irvine said, are, are quite extensive. It's just a matter of our imagination and as circumstances evolve, where we see, aha, this, this would be a helpful uh, additional tool to have. And Dr. Luhung, you know, yes. now that a device uh, is here, you've got the samples, it has gone through trials. What are the next steps? Any plans for it to be on the market? Of course, that would be the ultimate goal uh, for that to be deployed in actual public spaces. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, uh, being able to detect and uh, make it work in such a highly ventilated space as a hospital actually showcased the robustness of this method. But that is not the only thing. If you think about actual applicability, you must think about what, what makes sense, how you integrate it with the existing uh, surveillance systems that we already had. If I can give you an example, uh, okay, I want to do an airborne surveillance of shopping mall A. Uh, how many air is a very volatile uh, media, right? You can imagine the concentration and the content in the air uh, keeps changing all the time. Then what is a reasonable uh, sampling time? Being able to detect it is one thing, right? But do you want to collect samples every five minutes? Then you will end up with hundreds, maybe even thousands of samples per day. Is that reasonable? Or maybe it's more reasonable to collect it uh, in a few hours per sample or something like that. All this requires a lot of uh, fine-tuning and also uh, preliminary trial uh, experiments and I think that would be the next steps that can be improved. Prof. Allen, Dr. Lu Hong, thank you so much for setting aside time to come on to the show. I've been speaking with Associate Professor David Allen from NUS's Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine and Dr. Irvan Lu Hong from the Singapore Centre for Environmental Life Sciences Engineering. Wrapping up today's other headlines, a man was found dead in a bedroom after a fire broke out in a Jurong West HDB flat. According to preliminary investigations, the fire was of electrical origin from a PMD. Another man had been evacuated before SEDF personnel arrived and was taken to Singapore General Hospital with burn injuries. Singapore's giant panda cub is not yet two months old, but surprise, surprise, he's already got six baby teeth. Wildlife Reserve's Singapore says the appearance of teeth is earlier than expected as baby pandas usually start teething when they are about three months old. The cub, yet to be named, should start attempting to chew on bamboo at the age of about seven months. Thousands of Newcastle United fans gathering outside St James Park celebrating the takeover of the club by a Saudi Arabia-led group. The new owners say the deal would mean long-term investment to harness the club's potential. For the fans, including our sports correspondent Zazali Abdul Aziz, they are hoping it means one thing, winning trophies. But first, the team will have to battle its way out of the Premier League bottom three. 
I think a lot of people are, are talking about you know how Newcastle's wait for a trophy will end soon. You know, people are imagining who the club will sign with their new financial might. Uh, but I think I speak for a, a sizable number of Newcastle fans who are simply just relieved. Uh, we are no longer under the ownership of Mike Ashley. Uh, his 14-year reign was was painfully unambitious and, and sucked the joy out of supporting the club for many fans. So much so that uh, many decided to walk away uh, and only return once he left. Uh, plus, the reality of it all is that you know he relinquishes control of the club while we are uh, it, you know precariously placed on the Premier League table uh, with an underwhelming squad and an underwhelming manager at their helm. Uh, and I think the immediate priority uh, is to address this before thinking ahead about signing mega stars or winning Champions Leagues or so on. Um, and and also having said that, uh, recent history with clubs uh, bought over by rich owners like Chelsea, Manchester City, and, and Paris Saint Germain have shown that you know there isn't always immediate success, and there may well be pitfalls along the way, meddling owners and, and so on, disrupting harmony in the team. Uh, but if there's one thing Newcastle fans uh, have developed over the last decade and a half. Uh, it's a strong resolve, even when things uh, are not going their way. So, again, like I said, you know, it's, it's uncharted territory right now. Uh, and even if things are not smooth sailing all the way under this new ownership, I'm sure we'll be able to weather the storm just fine. Now, before I go, Philippine journalist Maria Ressa has jointly won this year's Nobel Peace Prize alongside Russian journalist Dmitry Muratov. The Norwegian Nobel Committee chairman saying that both are receiving it for their courageous fight for freedom of expression in their countries. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. I'm Harian Todiman. Thanks for watching The Big Story and I'll see you next week.